Let's make a mind map for thermal physics. You can download the full A-level and GCSE-like version of this mind map on my website, scienceshorts.net. Internal energy is the sum, that means total of, kinetic energy and potential energy of all particles in a substance. If we raise the temperature of a substance, the kinetic energy of the particles increases, and if we change the state of the substance, say from solid to liquid, liquid to gas, the potential energy of the particles increases. We can draw a heating curve for something like ice, and over time as we're giving it heat, we can see that the temperature goes up, but then it flattens out when it changes state at zero and 100 degrees Celsius. So like we said, when things are changing states, specifically solid to liquid, liquid to gas, the heat or the energy that goes in is not contributing to kinetic energy, only potential energy by breaking bonds. Not breaking chemical bonds like covalent bonds, but intermolecular bonds. Okay, so we have an equation that tells us how much energy is needed to raise the temperature of a substance. It's E, you might see Q, but I like E because it's energy, equals mass times specific heat capacity, that's specific to the material, times the change in temperature delta T. For changing state, we have the specific latent heat equation, energy equals M times SLH. I've had a bit of a brain fart there. Don't worry, it's fixed on the mind map. There are two different specific latent heats. You have the specific latent heat of fusion and of vaporization. First is for melting and freezing. Second one is for obviously evaporating and going backwards condensing as well. So the idea and the equations are fairly easy, but they've asked some pretty tricky questions even at GCSE on this lately. If you have a solid that is melting and the temperature goes up, then we know that the energy is equal to M times SHG times delta T and M times SLH, because we need both of those energies to raise the temperature and change the state. So therefore we can factorize it. We can say energy is equal to mass times SHG times delta T plus SLH. And this is just for A level. If two substances come into contact with each other, eventually they will end up at a common temperature. So if you have a question on this, all you have to do is equate those two energies, MC delta T, okay, it might be melting as well, but not in this case that I've written down. And delta T is going to be the common temperature, take away the starting temperature or vice versa. Okay, something that's pretty much just GCSE. There's three methods of heat transfer, one through conduction, that's for solids. That's when heat is transferred through vibrations because the particles can't move. Convection, that's for any fluid, that's liquids or gases. Hot portions of a fluid are less dense because the particles are further apart. They're not bigger, they're just further apart. So it rises and cold fluid falls to take its place. Radiation, that's infrared electromagnetic wave, and that's absorbed specifically by electrons in a material. Okay, the gas laws, Boyle's law is pressure is inversely proportional to volume, that's for a constant temperature. Charles's law, volume proportional to temperature, that's for a constant pressure. And the pressure law, sometimes called the Gay-Lussac law, pressure is proportional to temperature for a constant volume. Complete gas law is PV equals NKT or NRT. Big N, number of molecules, little n, number of moles. K, Boltzmann constant, R, gas constant, it's just converted from K. NRT is much easier to deal with because they're much nicer numbers, R being 8.31. Okay, let's do some thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics is this. Q equals delta U plus W. Q being heat that goes into a system, delta U being the change in internal energy, and that's ultimately temperature, and W is work done and a gas has to expand in order to do work. Okay, there are four main types of processes that a gas can undergo. Isothermal, that's when temperature is constant. So that means NRT and NK2 constant. So that means that PV is constant as well. So PV is the same at the start and at the end. So P1V1 equals P2V2. And if the temperature stays the same, then delta U is equal to zero. Isobaric, that's when pressure is constant. Isochoric, that's when volume is constant. We can create proportionality equations similarly for those two. I've put them the wrong way around here, but they're fixed with the mind map. And we have adiabatic. Adiabatic is when there is no heat in or out of a system, so Q is equal to zero, so that means delta U is equal to minus W. It's not PV is constant this time, but it's PV to the power of gamma gamma being the adiabatic constant, you'll always be given that, you'll never have to remember those. The second law can be written like this, heat cannot be converted into work unless it flows from a hot space to a cold space. So that means you're always going to get a change in temperature somewhere in the system, so that means that no engine can be 100% efficient. Kinetic theory, there are five assumptions that we need to remember. Raved, R is random motion of particles, A is attraction, there is none, V is volume of particles is negligible, E is elastic collisions, and D, duration of collisions is negligible compared to duration between collisions. 
Here's the final equation, PV equals third NMC RMS squared, CRMS being root mean square speed. So CRMS squared is also called mean square speed. Be careful that you don't get those two confused. If you want to see how to derive PV equals third NMC squared, then have a look at my kinetic theory video. We can use density in the equation. If we divide the whole thing by volume, we end up with NM over V. That is total mass over volume, that's density. So P equals third rho C squared. Let's prove EK equals 3 halves KT. If you know PV equals a third NMC squared, then we know that's also equal to NKT. Cancelling the ends, we end up with a third MC squared equals KT, very similar to half MC squared for kinetic energy. Equate those two and we end up with kinetic energy is equal to 3 halves KT. Okay, let's have a look at some engines. This applies for most A-level specifications, but for AQA, it's only if you do engineering physics optional module. Here's the Otto cycle for a petrol engine. We have four strokes. It means the cylinder goes up, down, up, down. First up, down is the exhaust and intake strokes. We're not massively fussed about those, but it undergoes adiabatic compression, and then air-fuel mix is ignited by a spark plug, and then we have the power stroke, where we have the adiabatic expansion. Diesel, on the other hand, looks slightly different. What we have is air compressed and heated, and then we inject the fuel in, and the fuel is ignited by the hot air. The area enclosed in each loop is equal to net work done per cycle. If you times that by the number of cylinders and times that by the cycles per second, then that gives us the indicated power of the engine. And obviously any area under a PV graph is equal to work done. Thermal efficiency is equal to indicated power divided by input power. We don't really use percentages, just decimals now. Mechanical efficiency, brake power, that's output power, divided by indicated power. That's where power and energy is lost due to friction. And overall efficiency, brake power divided by input power. The maximum theoretical efficiency of an engine can be given by the difference in temperatures between the hot space and the cold space divided by the temperature of the hot space. Coefficient of performance for heat pumps and fridges, basically the reciprocal of efficiency. So we end up with a number bigger than one. And for a heat pump, we put hot temperature on top and fridge, we put cold temperature on top because that's what we want for both. And we can replace these temperatures with heat cues and the equations still hold true. Brownian motion, that just describes a random motion of particles inside of gas, and it can be proved by looking at small smoke particles. We can see them wiggling around, which means that we have air particles colliding with them randomly. Lastly, you might have a graph for pressure or volume against temperature. It might be the Charles's law or pressure law experiment, and you can find absolute zero from this without doing extrapolation on the graph because it's very inaccurate. What we have is a straight line graph, y equals mx plus c, or p, let's say, equals mt plus c. We find the gradient m, and we use that at any point on the line to find the y-intercept c, and then we plug that back into the equation for zero pressure equals m times absolute zero temperature plus c, and hopefully you'll end up with a temperature of about minus 273 degrees Celsius. So I hope that helps. If it did, please leave a like, and if you want to test your knowledge on this stuff, then click on the card and it'll take you to my flashcards. See you there.